Hello, how are you guys today? Grandma is going to start with chapter four of Charlie's Monument. It's called The Rock Pile. Do you remember up to this point, Charlie has started his job being a guard, a, a lookout a, on the top of the rock to protect the town from the Indians. And he's got his first month's salary in advance, which was a horse and daily lunches to help him with his job. So this is chapter four. Each day for four years, Charlie spent every waking hour up on the hill. Always he was alone, and yet rarely was he lonely, for he allowed himself no time to think about it. And frequently his hill was visited, for often in the morning he would find the tracks of wandering coyote, deer or mountain lion in the wind rippled sand, while occasional buzzards swooped down in their circling to give closer scrutiny to the solitary figure on the rim rock. Several times his careful observations prevented serious problems with the Indians, for with smoke to get attention and then a pre-arranged number of rifle shots to indicate the direction of the potential attack, he was always able to warn the townspeople to get ready. Then one very warm and overcast August night, Charlie crawled down the familiar trail he had worn in the hill, climbed on his horse, and made his way through the darkness into town. Tying his horse to a rail, he turned toward the sheriff's office, when from out of the darkness he heard his name spoken. Charlie turned, about to reply, when he heard another voice, and then he realized that he was not being spoken to, but about. Yep, the first voice was saying, you got no need of fear and engines in this town. Know why? Because we got Charlie up there on Baldy, and he always lets us know when any Redskins is near. Charlie, I never met no Charlie in this town, and I've been here three months now. You sure you ain't spinning some kind of yarn? Mr. Charlie ain't no yarn. He's plain all right. And the reason you ain't met him is because he's always up on Baldy where he's supposed to be. It's his job. Hmm. The stranger grunted skeptically. I guess he don't never come down neither, right? And he seemed to sneer as he said it. Why, sure he comes down every night, as a matter of fact, long about now. My friend, the stranger replied, You'll excuse me if I don't believe you too carefully. It just ain't normal for a man to spend forever sitting up on top of a hill. Yup, it's pretty tough to believe in something that don't sound no better than that. With that, the two men went off into the darkness and Charlie eventually went home to bed. But sleep did not come. At first, he berated himself for not having gone forward to set the record straight or for not having at least spoken to them. But in the wee hours of the morning, his thoughts took a new turn, so serious that he sat bolt upright in bed. What if he spent his whole life up there on that hill? Why, when he finally died, no one would know he had ever even lived. Other men left children and families with memories of themselves. But what was out there for him? What could he do? As Charlie began his climb the next morning, a light rain was falling. In the darkness, his hand touched a stone that felt unlike any he had noticed before. It was as smooth as silk, but in the inky blackness of the pre-dawn, he was unable to see it. Intrigued, he determined that he must see it. However, he knew that in order to do that, he would have to carry it to the top and wait for daylight to see what kind of stone it was. Struggling with his one hand to push the stone ahead of him, Charlie made his way up the muddy slope to the top of the hill. In the gray light of dawn, it turned out to be an ordinary stone, made smooth by ancient water action. But Charlie's day was spent in dreams about that stone. He dreamed of how it might have originally formed, where it had come from during its long history, and how many rivers it rolled along before it was worn down so smooth. And the thought came to him that he himself was like that rock, 
being gradually smoothed down by some pretty rough experiences along his river of life. Darkness came so suddenly that Charlie was surprised. His day had passed more quickly than any other he could remember. There's a picture of a rock. May have been like the one that Charlie pushed up the hill, maybe not. The next morning, in order to repeat, to repeat his pleasant experience of the day before, Charlie found another unusual rock and pushed it to the top to study during the day. For eight days, this continued. Charlie studied each rock carefully, attempting to decide its composition, its origin, and its history. He then wrote in his mind a sort of textbook of geology concerning his rocks. In the evening of the eighth day, as he bent to place his stone on top of the seven others he had brought up, he stopped in amazement. Why, there it was, the answer to his problem. His eight stones piled four, three, and one, he made a little monument. He could carry a stone to the top every day, and by the time his job ended, there would be quite a pile. If nothing else, he would at least be remembered by his monument. So Charlie began his task, and over the weeks, months, and years, it became a labor of love. Each day, he carefully chose a stone for his planned monument, and each day he pushed, shoved, lifted, rolled, and even dragged his stone to the top of the hill, there to place upon his growing pile which he carefully arranged and added to so that it would not fall. One day when Charlie was nearly 24, a whole new problem entered his life. He was sitting on the rim rock rather casually watching the town through his glasses and paying absolutely no attention to what he was seeing when out of the bank and into his heart walked the most beautiful lady he had ever seen. He came to his feet with a lurch and then as quickly was back down, lying on his stomach, with the glasses resting on a rock to steady them so he could see better. Quickly, he revised his original opinion. He didn't think she could really be called beautiful. She was more, well, pretty, or striking was the word he wanted. Her hair gleamed like a red fire in the afternoon sun, and she walked with a ladylike yet determined step as though she knew exactly what she was doing and where she was going. Too quickly, she turned into a side street and was gone from his view. But try as he would, Charlie could not get her image from his mind. Through the rest of that day and all through the night and all through the next day, Charlie fought his thoughts. One instant he would be thinking of her, wondering who she was and where she had come from. And the next he would be berating himself as a foolish dreamer. He just couldn't imagine why the brief glimpse of an unknown girl would affect him in such a way. Through his youth, he had never allowed himself to feel an interest in girls, knowing that his deformities created obstacles that weren't worth overcoming, both for him and for any girl he might have felt an interest in. He realized that his attitude had become quite self-defeating, and that perhaps he really had been feeling sorry for himself. But he had never felt that he had anything much to offer a young woman except problems. After all, what girl would ever want to be saddled with a man so strange and deformed as he was? The very idea of himself with a girl had been so foreign that he had long ago ceased to consider and worry about it. Now, suddenly, with no warning, he was beset with thoughts of this unknown beauty and his mind was disturbingly unsettled. Charlie paced his hilltop, spent extra hours studying the mountains around him, reread his few books, examined his rocks, tore down and restacked his growing monument, and studiously avoided any direct glance at the town, but all to no avail. And what made the agony even worse was the certainty that he would never know who she was, could never speak to her, and would never satisfy the longing that he felt to get to know her. So Charlie has seen a girl that he's interested in. Remember, grandma loves you.